think I will ever get used to my introduction or seeing my videos because it talks about me being an Olympian, an Olympic champion, a three-time Olympic champion, Canada's most successful summer Olympic athlete. Like seriously, who does that? That's kind of like stuff I always, like I was th always used to think that superheroes did. And when I think of the Olympics, when I grew up thinking of the Olympics, I always used to think it was superheroes that went, you know, like Buzz Lightyear to infinity and beyond. Like who gets to reach for infinity? Like I, I just always thought of myself as a normal person and I grew up, I grew up actually in Etobicoke and uh, you know, apparently I've had funny curly hair since I was born. But I used to play all sports, and I was certainly not a superhero when it came to doing sports as a kid. I was about as normal as it came. I did baseball, I was normal. Soccer, I was normal. I have extraordinarily normal agility. I have extraordinarily normal hand-eye ball coordination. I have below normal sprint speed. I, when I did soccer, when I did basketball, I, Okay, I, I do have a little sport claim to fame. In Etobicoke, I probably hold a record in basketball. In the first four minutes and 15 seconds of the first quarter, I fouled out. <laughs> I don't think anyone has ever fouled out of a basketball game faster than I did. I was just like the normal kid with no skills. And I was going through, and that's sort of how, what I was doing. But you know, one day I found rowing. And suddenly, I didn't feel so normal because I kind of got rowing and, and it started getting into my ego. It started, I started thinking I was pretty good. And it didn't hurt that I started to win stuff. You know, with my partner Kathleen, you start feeling like a superhero because now I've got gold medals. And truthfully, I have a lot of gold medals. This is, this is actually just a really small sampling of the gold medals. This is just like kind of the big ones. This is world championship medals, uh, let's see, world championship medals, Olympic uh, medals, and, and mostly all gold, too, by the way, because, you know, <laughs> silvers and bronzes, whatever. Um, so, <laughs> so there's uh, Olympic medals, world championship medals, Commonwealth Game medals, Pan Am medals, I got Canadian national championship medals, US national championship medals, but they're kind of easy to win. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of medals, and I start thinking, oh, you know, this is pretty good, but, you know, nobody cares about these medals. All you ever care about, all people ever talk about are my Olympic medals. And really, you know what, all you ever talk about are the three Olympic gold medals. Like, who cares about the bronze, right? I care about the bronze. The person who is fourth cares that I have the bronze. <laughs> But, you know, if all you want to care about, if you, all you want to think are my superhero medals, are the golds, that's fine. Because when you win that many gold medals at the Olympics, you know what? You actually do feel like a superhero. Okay, fine. I grew up and I started thinking that I can't, became a superhero. But there was always this one thing. Every time I started to think I was a superhero, something happens to remind me that I'm a normal person. So I'm going to my first Olympic Games, right? And now this is like opening ceremonies kind of stuff. This is the stuff we all dream of. When we watch the Olympics on TV, you know, we dream of it. And that normal kid growing up, I used to watch four to six hours a day of TV. So when the Olympics came up, that like ballooned like crazy. I watch a lot of TV. So now I'm like, I'm gonna get to be one of those Olympic superheroes. I'm gonna get to go to the Olympic Games and the opening ceremonies, that's like 100,000 people. And there's fireworks and the Olympic rings and the parade of nations. I'm gonna get to walk in with all the other Olympic superheroes, the Canadian superheroes in my Olympic superhero uniform. And when they say Canada, I'm gonna get to wave because every one of those 100,000 people are there and they're cheering for me. And this is awesome. I'm so excited. This is going to be my superhero moment. So my first Olympics was back for the, the Barcelona Olympics. And I tend to like to refer to them by the city because that doesn't age me so much. But I'm going to go with it. It was the 1992 Olympics. And I remember when I got my kit bag, you know, the bag that comes with all the uniform, my superhero uniform. I'm pretty stoked about this. This is, I'm not going to lie. I've got all this free stuff, because sometimes we refer to the Olympics as 16 days of free stuff. 
And here I go, and I'm like ripping this thing open because I want to see my superhero uniform. And I like open it up, and I'm like, what the hell? This is not what I was expecting. So now, right now, when we watch the Olympics, when we watch the Sochi team, we watch the team go to London, HBC dresses them, and they look fabulous. Like our team, the Canadian team, looks like superheroes. So much so that we all go running down to HBC and we're like, I'll take those mitts or that toque or that jacket. I'll have that sweatshirt, absolutely. I want to look a little bit like one of those superheroes. And I'm like, no, that's not what I got in 92. You know, 92 was in HBC and it wasn't even Roots. And Roots did a great job of branding us, wanting us to walk around red, wearing red and white and Canada on our back. No. It wasn't Roots. I don't know who it was who was designing the team's uniform, the superhero uniform for the 92 Olympics, but they missed the memo on red and white, right? So I, I remember I, I pulled out the shirt that was supposed to be um, our opening ceremony's uniform, and I'm looking at it, and quite honestly, the best way to describe what this piece of uniform looked like was Mediterranean, multicolor, mosaic puke. <laughs> like, it was so terrible. When I brought it back home to my mom, it was so bad my mom didn't want it, right? <laughs> so I've got this Mediterranean mosaic puke jacket to go with the skorts. So proud to wear skorts. Huge shoulder pads, a bright, bright yellow blouse, bright yellow blouse, these, these clip-on yellow earrings that were supposed to, I don't know, represent the Mediterranean sun or something like that. Of course, let's go with the stereotypical yet bad uh, white cowboy hat made of, I don't know, not what cowboys would wear. And you're just sitting there and I'm like, not so superhero. And so they're looking at us right before we walk into the opening ceremonies and they're like, you guys don't really look very Canadian. We should give you something that'll make you look a little more Canadian. And uh, 1992 was Canada 125, and there happened to be a couple crates of these, let's generously describe them as flags. So they're like, well, let's give all the athletes these flags. So we all got this thing, and we're like, what are we supposed to do with this? And they're like, well, put it on your hand. So this flag thing best, can best be described as a potholder in the shape of a maple leaf. So I can tell you, without any exaggeration, it's really hard to feel like... <laughs> it's really hard to feel like a superhero when you're dressed like this. You know, so once again, I realize I, I'm put on this, this planet as a normal person with an opportunity to do some pretty special things. So a week later, uh, my rowing partner and I, Kathleen Heddle, we, 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 I think we crossed the Rubicon into superhero territory. I'm like, well, if it wasn't the opening ceremonies, then crossing the finish line at Olympic Games first, you start to feel a little bit like a superhero. You can't help it. Like, we crossed it first, ahead of the Americans, ahead of the Germans, ahead of the, the French and the British, the Romanians, the Bulgarians, ahead of them all we crossed first. And with that, yeah, with that, we're gonna get to sing the national anthem. Like, this is definitely superhero moment. And now, remember I told you that normal kid used to watch a lot of television, and I used to love watching the Olympic Games. Part of that, when I watch the Olympic Games, I like to see the athletes sing. I like to see them involved. It's their gold medal, sing! I almost swore there. <laughs> sing. So I'm like, absolutely, I am going to be a superhero, and I am going to sing that anthem, and I'm going to be singing in front of a global television audience, and how much of a superhero is, uh-oh, there's that moment again. So I'm singing away with Kathleen Heddle, and I'm thinking, this is absolutely great, and it's going to look so cool on the television, and holy crap, I'm getting the words wrong. I'm getting the words wrong to our own national anthem. I am nowhere near the right words. And 
what happened and why would they tell people this? But in, in, in Barcelona, they shortened all the anthems down to 45 seconds so they would fit into a television commercial. How brutal is that? Why would you tell a bunch of Canadian rowers? They're just normal. So I'm sitting there and I'm trying to figure out where we are in the anthem because I feel like a complete idiot and now we're coming up to the pro part so I'm gonna sing it in French. And Kathleen looks over at me with this look that I'm very used to. It's like, you can almost see it here. It's like the what the heck are you doing now look. <laughs> and then I realized that this is the gold medal ceremony and I got the words wrong to our national anthem but we won the Olympics and I'm bawling. I start to bawl. So I've got the anthem wrong and I'm bawling. And I can guarantee you, you feel really normal when you're bawling in front of a global television audience. So there I am, I'm like, okay, I'm back, I'm on the ground again, I'm a normal person. Well, four years later, we're going back to the Olympics again. It's a pretty good career I've got, but four years later, I'm going back. And the Atlanta Olympics were different. They were the 100th anniversary of the Olympic Games. Atlanta is so close to Toronto and all the marketing that it was being very much treated like a, a home games, very much the way we approached Vancouver. And the thing that was different about the Atlanta Olympics is now it's not just me thinking that I might be a superhero, but going into the Atlanta Olympics, we are world and Olympic champions, and now everybody else is starting to think that we're superheroes too. You look, we're on the front page of magazines, we're on the front page of newspapers. Oh my God, my parents think I'm a superhero now. When, your parent, when you cross the line and your parents think you're a superhero, you're doing something right. So my parents think I'm a superhero and that we can win the Olympics, and you know what? We knew we could. And so we go in with all this potential but there was a couple of things to do first. And before you get to be a superhero, you have to do something super. And I remember this is the start line in Atlanta. And the thing was, as much as we wanted to go and be superheroes and win this race and win a, a, another gold medal for Canada, at the bottom of the screen is the Germans. And they have won the last oh, six Olympic gold medals in this event. Beside them is the Dutch. The Dutch last year and the previous year at the World Championships in a seven minute rowing race, it takes 2,000 2, meters, takes seven minutes, we beat them by 0 .04. And the truth was the Dutch had been winning the whole race and the stroke where Kathleen and I took the lead in that race happened to be the stroke where we crossed the finish line. The Dutch have spent the whole year being totally pissed at us. They, they think that they can win this race. The next boat, the white boat there, is Kathleen and I. Then you have China. They're the only crew to have beaten us at a World Cup earlier that year in Munich. They think we're vulnerable. Then you have New Zealand, have been the world champions twice in the last four years. And Australia at the top. They are like that young crew coming up. They're going to have a fabulous career. We just don't know when it's going to start. And so I'm sitting there and we're waiting to start right there, which is the worst thing before any big task we do, before anything that scares us, before any of our infinite dreams and our big challenges, the hardest part of any task is waiting to start. And at that moment right there, Kathleen and I are waiting to start and there's two things I say to Kathleen, which is amazing for someone who talks so much that there's only two things that I say to her at that moment. And the first is breathe. We have to relax. We have to focus. We have a race plan. We have a plan. We have to stick to what we know because nothing will help us cross the finish line faster than focusing on task. If all we're thinking about is being a superhero and winning, we will never get there. And so I say task to Kathleen and then I say this, the last thing I'll say to her before we go, and it's outlast. Because the thing we know about hard, challenging things is that the way we're gonna win isn't by being the best, because we actually know everybody in this race is already the best. They're the best in their country. On any given day, they can be the best. But today, we need to outlast them. And we took off. And for the first thousand meters, for the first three and a half minutes, it was like this, stroke for stroke six boats right across. In a seven minute rowing final, my heart rate will be between 196 and 204 beats per minute the entire time. 
At any point in time, the amount of lactic acid in our system is to toxic. If I were to take that amount of lactic acid that I could handle then and put it into my body, let alone any one of your bodies, we would clump on the floor in a toxic mess of pain and ah. Oh, you will never see a rower do a victory lap. <laughs> <laughs> So here we are halfway through the race, and it's like tight. It's all, no one's giving anything up to us, but that's okay, because Kathleen and I have a move. And we make a move at about 1,000 meters halfway through the race, and we go 30 strokes, takes us 300 meters, 30 strokes with an incredible burst of energy, and it works, and we break out into the lead. And that's fantastic. And this is when we start to think about outlasting. This is when we know we have to outlast them, because our, the way we burst with energy is no different than when you have a budget. Where you spend your money, you don't have it to spend later. So what we spent at the thousand, we know that everybody is going to be spending on us later. And they start to do that. And they catch up. And as we're coming into the last 250 meters, the last 25 strokes of the race, the Chinese and the Dutch have caught up on us so much that I can hear them talking. I have no idea what they're saying. But... <laughs> I can hear them talking, you know, I can hear that they're getting excited, they've closed the gap, and then I've got 20 strokes to go, and there's 16,000 people on my right side, there's another 3,000 people on my left side, going bananas, it's the Olympic finals. Kathleen can barely hear me, and I look, I'm, I'm like sitting there, and I know I've got 10 strokes left to go, but I'm hitting like my Mission Impossible moment now. These 10 strokes now, I'm starting to feel super normal. I do not feel like a superhero right now. I only have 10 strokes left to get us to the finish line, but I don't have 10 strokes left in me. I have spent all of my energy. I have got nothing left. The 10 strokes left, they feel like an infinite goal to me. Absolutely impossible. And that's when you go back to your training, and that's the things that are important to you. And I went back to the fact that I have a personal philosophy, and it's a philosophy of more. And it's not more of what I can get, although I have to admit, I've always really liked that. It's more about what I can do. I can always do and try and learn and be a little bit more. And so that's what I focused on right then because now I've got 10 strokes left, and I don't have 10 strokes in me, but I look at Kathleen. I look at her back, and I'm not gonna let her down, and I honestly, truly, to my core, did not kn I knew I did not have 10 strokes in me, but I could give Kathleen one stroke, and I knew I didn't have nine strokes left in me, but I knew I could give Kathleen one stroke, and so I focused with Kathleen until it got to that point where there's five strokes left. The Chinese are coming. One stroke more. There's four strokes left. The Dutch are coming. The Germans are coming. One stroke more. Just, I don't have three. I can't do three, so I don't focus on three. And then I don't focus on two. All I have to do is just one stroke. When Kathleen Heddle and I crossed the finish in, in Atlanta, it wasn't because we attacked 220 strokes in one blow. It wasn't because we tried to attack infinity. It was because we kept attacking one stroke at a time. I can do that. Normal people can do that. But you know what? We crossed the finish line again, and first, it was absolutely the hardest thing I've ever done in my life but I'm starting to feel like a superhero again. <laughs> you know, everyone's coming down and cheering. There were so many of my friends and family there. This is amazing stuff. You know, I get the third gold medal. Oh my God, they're making this huge deal about it. We've already, by this time, we've already had a media interview. They're calling it historic. We conquered. Look at the poor Dutch girl on the left. The poor girl. Oh. Sorry, Eka. Um, that's her name. Anyways, so we conquered and we killed it. And I'm starting to feel like a superhero again. But you know what happens uh, to superheroes? There's always that moment. And after winning a gold medal, you know you're going to go to doping control. And so, you know, nothing says champion like peanut cup. 
And when an Olympic athlete goes and we have to give a, a urine, urine sample, it's not like when you give a urine sample, you go to the doctor, it's a very private moment, you know, here's a cup and you come back, thank you very much. When an athlete has to give uh, a urine sample for doping control, you know what, I have a clipboard person, I have a chaperone. The chaperone comes with me and I go into the bathroom, I go into the stall, the stall door is open. Hey, I'm required to pull my top up to my, my bra strap, I'm required to pull my pants down to my knees. Hey, <laughs> now I have the cup and I have to give them a sample. And now, guys, you're thinking, what's the big deal? Because you can see the cup and you can aim at the cup. But with girls, it's not so straightforward. <laughs> so there I am, 30 minutes after this historic superhero moment, and I'm peeing all over my hand. This picture, <laughs> this picture is actually not from the Olympics, but um, and the, the bottle in my left hand is, or my right hand is a, a, a Czech drink called Lift. It looks very much like Mountain Dew, and in my left hand is my urine sample, which looks very much like Mountain Dew. <laughs> and you can imagine that it's like, yeah, it's impossible to feel like a superhero when you've just had this moment, but that's that's okay because. I, I know that's, that's the secret. The secret is you don't have to be a superhero. The secret is that to achieve all the success that you want, to achieve those infinite big goals and dreams, it's not about attacking infinity. It's about attacking the ones. Because the truth is we are all, I am, you are, we are all normal people. And we were all it, it's almost easy for us to attack the little tiny steps and the little bits of more all around us. And the thing is to remember, there truly are no superheroes because it's normal people like you and me who achieve infinity and in our dreams and our goals. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>